So a lot of what I do is head work because I can't give you talent. But what I can do if you've got talent is help you to focus it and utilize it and not have <laughs> fear and nerves that keep you from that talent. If you've ever had that self voice in your head that's ever said to you, you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not talented enough, uh, they're not going to like you, they're not going to respect you, you can't do that. If you've ever had that voice go off in your head, say yes. 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 That's really, that's it? <laughs> say yes. yes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> right? We all have it. I call mine Beelzebub. I've got a name. <laughs> Beelzebub is a funny thing because you can't get rid of Beelzebub. You'll never get rid of it. It's hardwired into your system. It's in your subconscious. The reason it's there is because when we lived in caves, we needed Beelzebub. Beelzebub was the guy that said, don't leave the cave. Mammoth will eat you. Don't put your hand in the fire. You only have two. <laughs> that was Beelzebub at the time. And Beelzebub protected us and saved us. But now we've gotten to a point over the years that we handle most of those things. But you know what? Beelzebub is now in our genes. It's in our, our, our uh, conscious, subconscious. We're hardwired. So what I do, again, also with uh, clients, is to help them live with Beelzebub. What, in terms of social situations, what are the most nerve-wracking social situations that you can think of? Speaking in front of crowds. Speaking in front of crowds. Number one in this country, maybe the world, they've done surveys over and over every year. The number one fear is public speaking. The number two fear, do you know what that is? Death. <laughs> you understand what that means. That means if you're at a funeral, you would rather be in the coffin than doing the eulogy. <laughs> the reason these are so nerve-wracking and Beelzebub is talking to you the entire time during an interview, during a date, you know, during those kinds of situations. It's because you're thinking about you. You're worried about you. How do I sound? How do I look? Does this person like me? Am I doing it right? What causes the most nerves with people when they are public speaking, when they're on a date, when they're going on a job interview, is they're thinking about themselves. And that will mess you up every time. Here's the hardest thing that any client that I've had can learn. This is the hardest thing that you will ever learn. If you don't walk out of here with anything else after tonight, walk out of here with this. And this is the secret of life, honestly. The secret of, <clears throat> no, this, <laughs> it's not about you. It's not about you. If you just remember that, if you just use that, you know when you're f with your friends and you're hanging, do you ever worry about, oh my gosh, are they going to like me? Is my hair okay? Is my voice okay? Is it, do you ever get nervous? No, you don't care. They're your friends, <laughs> whatever, right? Love me or leave. <laughs> the second we begin to care about ourselves is the second we start to create nerves because then when we start thinking about ourselves, we listen to Beelzebub. Beelzebub then becomes real and truthful. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard that line where people will say, you know, if you ever talk in front of people, just think of them in their underwear and that'll help. Have you ever heard that? Really, the only reason that helps is because you're not thinking about you anymore. You're thinking about them. Whenever you get into a situation, I will tell you, the next time you go on a date, a job interview, whatever that is, you think the entire, look, the entire time you're there, this is about them. I just want to know about them. I want to find out about them. I'm going to ask them questions. Tonight, it's not about me. 
I will tell you, you will breeze through it. 38% of your communication are the emotional tones that you attach to your communication. It's the emotions. People won't remember what they had for lunch three days ago. They'll remember an accident they had 20 years ago like it was yesterday. All of the pictures and emotions that are connected to it. I can say Y'all see that? You know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> She's looking at me. <laughs> you didn't know you were going home with somebody tonight, did you? <laughs> no, I did not say that. Are there administrators here? Am I going to get in trouble? <laughs> She's freaking out. All right. <laughs> All right. You ready? Yeah? Yeah, she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> hey, I love you. Have I communicated it the way you thought I was going to communicate it? Was my intent the way you thought it was going to be? But I said the words. I don't understand. It's not about the words. It's not about the words. Now, I'm not saying you should have bad words. Whether you're writing, whether you're speaking, it should be Shakespeare. However, I've seen a lot of bad actors do Shakespeare. Guess what? It ain't Shakespeare anymore. <laughs> Great communicators can take okay writing and make it sound better. Great writing can't do anything if you can't communicate it. I don't care if that's scripts, I don't care if that's uh, music, if that's songs. And in this business, especially in, in country music, especially. I'm many times dealing with young artists trying to get them to understand, look, yeah, you have to have the good song and you have to have a good voice, but you already have those. I have to help you to communicate that to the audience because if it's just about your song, I don't need you. Let's just some, throw out some CDs and be done with it. Hands and eyes are very important. There are two parts of the body that the subconscious is always monitoring when you're watching somebody communicate, singing, talking, whatever, standing there. You're always looking at, their subconscious is always looking at the eyes and the hands. The subconscious doesn't much care what any other part of the body is doing unless it's doing something uh, goofy. But the hands, just take the hands. If the hands, this, there's, a, there's, a, there's a position in the body called the neutral zone. It's between the waist and the chest. The neutral zone, if you keep your hands in the neutral zone when you're talking and you don't do anything goofy with them, you're just sort of using them like this, then the subconscious will just sort of let it go. But as soon, even in the neutral zone, as your hands start doing something that don't go along with the communication, if I talk to you the whole time like this, <laughs> after a while, even though I haven't changed the way I'm talking to you, these guys would move back a little bit in the next row and no one else would want to talk to me ever <laughs> because of this. If I'm talking to you and my hands leave the neutral zone, now it's theater. <laughs> or if I'm talking to you and my hands leave the neutral zone, <laughs> right? <laughs> Suddenly people, you start to freak out because it doesn't matter what I'm saying. The hands tell you everything. The eyes are the windows to the soul. If I say to you, hi, what's your name? Shannon. Shannon. Um, Shannon, uh, where are you from? Yeah. Uh, did you ever go to a, uh, uh, a school dance of any kind? Yeah. Uh, now, when I asked you that question, what was the first thing that you did? Yes. Why did you look over there? I'm like standing right here. Why did you look over there? Remembering. When we're going to tell the truth, the first thing we'll do is we'll look for it in our head. Because we know the truth is a file 
in our head. It's filed away. Prom. Hold on. Got it. <laughs> it's a picture in our head. Truth is pictures in our head because the brain is visual and it works in pictures. It's not like a computer with O's and ones. It works in pictures. So when we're about to tell the truth, most people, if you ask them something, and it's not something that happened right this second, but something that happened a long time ago, the first thing they'll do is they'll go, uh, and then they'll come back and talk to you. So just know, unless, unless they're a pathological liar or they've been in this little talk, just know that if you ask them, where were you Friday night? If they go, um, you know they're about to tell you the truth because they're looking at it. They're seeing it. Now, what are they going to do if they're going to lie? They'll look straight at you or down. Because guess what? They know there's no picture in their head. There's nothing to see. And this is what we make things up with. So they'll look down and look back at you. People ask you all the time, what are you going to do with your life? Blah, blah, blah. And you're just saying, look, I just need to get through tomorrow. I got a test. Leave me alone. At a certain point, every successful person that I've worked with that had, that maintained a success for a period of time in a career, every single one saw it way before they did it. Now, along the way, their goals would change. But they never would have changed goals because they never would have been on a path because they never would have had that vision. So the vision is a key to success. If you can think, what should I be, what, what would I like to be five years from now, ten years from now? I need to see that person. Everything about them, their social life, uh, what kind of money they have, where they're living, uh, uh, th their career. If you can see it, it's easier to do it. Successful people make lists. Have you ever made a list? Yeah. The great thing about making a list is what? Once you make that list, you can't throw it away. You got to do it, right? You got to like cross it off. It bugs you. When it's sitting on your desk and you're away from it, you think about it. And it's crazy. All you did was take it out of your head and put it on paper. But once you do that, you've made a covenant with yourself. I got to do this now. If you will think, who am I 10 years from now? I know it's a long way off. There's a lot of things that are going to happen between now and then. But if you can do that and vision that and write it up, it's very likely you will become a success. It may not be that. But because of that path that you've put yourself on, you will find things you never would have found had you not been on that path to begin with. You have to believe you deserve it. There's a little arrogance to people who are very successful because they had to believe that they were worth it, that they could do it, that they deserved it. So winning, the problem with winning is that once you win, you're not allowed to lose. And a lot of these people I work with are scared because early on in their career, they did something stellar and now they've spent the rest of their life chasing after it. And so... It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's just a fascinating process, but understanding that you have to have the courage to believe that you deserve to win. You deserve to be in the same room with everybody else, and it doesn't mean you're going to get the exact same results as everybody else, but it's about the journey, and it's about you succeeding on that path, and that takes you believing, having the, enough arrogance to say, I deserve this.